So hello everyone, uh, I'm Trey Asbury. I'm an associate professor here at uh, Lincoln Memorial University, uh, the host school for this Zoomapalooza. Uh, I'm currently the, uh, the director of a new online master's program in psychology that uh, we're trying to get kickstarted this fall. So if you have uh, any interest in getting your master's online, uh, a general psychology program, uh, please reach out to me. Uh, you can find me on LMU's website. If you go to uh, academics and graduate programs, uh, you'll see the MS in psych listed there and you'll find my contact information. So our second speaker of the final day of uh, this Zoom event is uh, Dr. Chris Fullwood. Uh, he's from the University of Wolverhampton in England, I believe uh, you're about five years ahead of us, Chris, or five years, five hours. Oh, yes. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a time five years. <laughs> you're five uh, hours, hours ahead of us. <laughs> roughly, yeah, it's uh, um, currently four o'clock here. Well, yeah. you're probably light years ahead of me. Um, <laughs> in any way, any event, um, so Chris, Chris's research interests lie within the somewhat emerging field of cyber psychology. Uh, I kind of loosely define that as uh, the relationship between technology and human behavior, which is a very general description. Uh, he has a particular focus on uh, online self-presentation, digital inclusion, and digital tools for improving psychological health. He is currently employed as a professor of cyber psychology at the University of Wolverhampton. Uh, there he leads the Center for Psychological Research. Uh, Professor Fullwood works closely with the British Psychological Society, having helped establish their cyber psychology section. He's published over 50 research outputs in his 20 year career, and he's, uh, he was the co editor for the Oxford Handbook of Cyber Psychology. Uh, I've known Chris uh, personally since uh, 2014. I had found his lab uh, on an internet search while I was teaching abroad for a semester in the UK. Uh, the Cyber Psychology Research at the University of Wolverhampton, uh, otherwise known as CRU, C R U W, is comprised of roughly uh, two dozen or so members and affiliates. I've had the pleasure of collaborating with several projects, research projects with Dr. Fullwood, uh, as well as some other CRU colleagues as an affiliate member. Um, I did want to share a brief memory of the first time I met Chris at Wolverhampton following a pleasant discussion. Uh, an exchange of ideas, we decided to schedule a second meeting to continue planning a collaborative project. I pulled out my smartphone to look at my calendar and Chris pulled out a notebook ledger. <laughs> and when I asked him why he didn't use his phone, he claimed that he disliked the technology. So as a cyber psychologist, I, I just kind of found this uh, both ironic and amusing. Uh, in any event, I'm pleased to introduce my friend and colleague, Dr. Chris Fullwood who will be presenting uh, our next talk. It's titled, Do Avatar Characteristics Change User Behavior? Exploring in-game and real-life effects in autistic and neurotypical participants. So welcome, Dr. Foley. Thank you very much, Trey. That was a lovely introduction. Um, I'm just gonna share the screen. So hopefully this will work. If it doesn't, please do let me know. Oops, just a few seconds. How's that? Can everyone see my PowerPoint slides? Yes. Excellent. Okay, so yeah, thank you very much, Trey, for the introduction. And uh, <laughs> yeah, the interesting memories that you shared there. I, I think part of the reason why I use a, a paper diary rather than my use my phone, which most normal people would do, is I, I like to keep um, work life and home life very separate. And I think that's even more important when we, you know, when we work in a sort of hybrid way like we are at the moment um is that the boundaries can become can rather blurred for people uh, so i like to be able to separate the two um also means i can make excuses when i don't turn up to meetings on time because i can just say i left my diary somewhere um <clears throat> it's harder to do because your phone's always by your side isn't it anyway i digress so yes today's presentation um is um around some research that we've been doing um, in the lab recently, I say recently, actually, to kind of give you the true story, we started collecting data for this project just before COVID hit. Um, we managed to get up to about 32 participants um, and then COVID happened. And then we had to kind of pull out of the lab, uh, weren't allowed to go into the university for, for over a year, um, weren't allowed to use the lab equipment for a little bit longer 
because of the sort of health and safety guidelines at the time. Um, and we've only just managed to, um, to pick this project back up again. So the data that I'm going to be presenting to you is a few years old, um, and it's really incomplete data. Um, we've still got some interesting um, statistical uh, data to, to show you, uh, and I think the, the, the findings so far are really promising, but we're trying to bolster the, the participant numbers so that we can um, make sure that these findings are actually uh, meaningful. So it's a, pro um, a project that's um, underway, should we say, and uh, the data that I'm presenting to you is kind of early stages of the research project. So <clears throat> not many people have heard about this project, so <laughs> hopefully it will be of interest to you. So yeah, the, the research, uh, before I start talking about the background to the research, it's worthwhile me just kind of giving a few shout outs to some of the collaborators. So the initial idea um, was developed over a coffee in Wolverhampton with my colleagues, Dr. Liam Cross and Dr. Gray Atherton, um, both of whom used to work at the University of Wolverhampton, but they now work at um, um, elsewhere in the UK. Um, they've moved up to Lancashire, in fact. Um, so they kind of helped me to develop the project. Oh, there we go, they're at Edge Hill University. Um, also, Darren Chadwick, who's a colleague of mine at Wolverhampton. I believe Trey's met Darren a few times as well. And a couple of our research students, um, Emma Eglinton, um, Diane Williams, who at the time were undertaking the MSc in cyber psychology. Um, and they're, they're both now moved on to bigger and better things. And Emma is actually doing a PhD with us at the moment. Um, and she's interested in loot boxing. Um, and uh, the correlates with gambling. So there's a lot of people there, it's worthwhile just kind of giving them thanks because the project wouldn't exist without them. <clears throat> so just in the way of a bit of background information about the project, you may or may not have come across um, the Proteus effect before. Um, it's a psychological effect that speaks to um, human um, computer interaction, in particular, um, human interaction with virtual worlds. So the original studies were conducted in you know, the early 2000s. Um, and basically what they suggest um, is that people will adopt uh, characteristics that, they, that are kind of stereotypically associated with the sort of physical features of an avatar or a character within a video game or within a virtual world. So you're looking at games like The Sims, for example, or Second Life as a virtual environment where you can go in and you can tailor your character. You can choose how you want them to look. So you can pick what sex you wanna be, you can pick your ethnicity, you can pick things like your height and your build, you can pick things like hairstyle, what kind of clothes you wear. So there's a huge degree of editability and you can choose to embody uh, whatever character you desire. Now, it isn't really rocket science to say that when people pick characters or have characters picked for them that have certain attributes, that people will start to adopt behaviours that they associate with those different attributes. So, for example, um, the research shows that people who um, play as taller avatars or taller video game characters um, tend to behave more assertively or more confidently within the video game or virtual world environment. Um, when people are given or choose to play as more attractive avatars, um, they tend to behave more flirtatiously and more confidently, um, again, within the context of the virtual world or the video game. Um, and the opposite is true. If people are given, say, shorter characters, they tend to behave less assertively, more timidly. If people are given less attractive avatars, they tend to behave um, less confidently and they tend to be more sort of wallflowers and sit in the corner and don't necessarily spark interactions. And this doesn't necessarily reflect the characteristics um, of the individual themselves. This is the characteristics they associate with the, the avatar. So the assumption would be if the avatar's 
attractive, they're going to be confident because we tend to associate um, attractive people as being more confident. So we might see this as a kind of form of in-game role play. I say that in of itself isn't particularly exciting. It's, it's not exactly rocket science. We would expect people to do this because they're, they're as I say, role playing, they're adopting characteristics that they associate with these different characters. Um, the really interesting bit is what happens afterwards. And you kind of get this, um, this is what the Proteus effect is, this residual effect that after the person um, comes out of or exits the, the virtual world or the video game, um, some of those behaviors that they exhibit within that environment seem to spill over and bleed into their offline behavior. And this is where Proteus comes from. Um, for your information, Proteus was a, a Greek god who had shape-shifting abilities. He could turn into different um, beings at will, take on different forms and different guises. So you can see where the name comes from. So the fact that people um, adopt these different characteristics in the video game isn't really hugely interesting. What's really interesting is that they continue for a little while afterwards to behave um, in line with those different characters um, after they exit the video game or after they've completed the, their stint in the virtual world. And this happens <clears throat> um, primarily has been investigated um, using um, an, what's referred to as an economic game. So essentially the participants will negotiate with a, a confederate who they do not realize as a confederate they'll negotiate over a fictional pot of money. Um, and we tend to find that the participants who are given more attractive avatars or taller avatars want a bigger share of that pot. And that's meant to be a kind of proxy measure of confidence. Whereas the participants who have the less attractive avatar or the shorter avatar tend to ask for a, short, uh, a smaller amount of money from that pot, a smaller share. And again, that's meant to be um, indicative of, of um, less confidence. Um, and that's irrespective of what you know, the level of confidence before they went into the game. So playing as the character seems to spill over just for a short while in terms of affecting the individual's behavior um, afterwards, which is really interesting. And Theorists have, have offered a number of different explanations for this. Um, and in particular, there are, there are three kind of key theories um, which have been used to explain this effect. So first of all, first of all we might refer to the kind of notion of de-individuation. So we know that when um, we kind of remove a, a lot of the characteristics that signal us out as an individual, um, so, for example, if we form part of a, a group or a crowd, you know, a um, good example is when we're thinking about things like violence and rioting in, in sort of um, soccer hooligans. <laughs> Doesn't happen so much in the US in terms of your sporting occasions, but in the UK, yes, yeah, so we, we were blighted by soccer hooligans for quite some time. And the idea is that people, when they're in groups, they, they, their, their level of self-awareness is kind of reduced and they kind of defer to the group identity. And the same occurs in other, other contexts in which the individual is more anonymous or pseudo-anonymous or what have you. Um, and you know, if you're putting on a, um, a new mask or becoming a different person or different character, you might have a, a, a loss of self-awareness. And this all happens very readily in, in video games because you're encouraged to kind of take on the role of a character to identify with the character because that's part of the, the game play and that's what part of makes it is part of what makes it enjoyable um if you weren't allowed you know, permitted to lose yourself in the moments then the game wouldn't be as fun just the same as if you're reading a book or watching a film you kind of lose yourself immerse yourself within that environment so it happens very readily in Kind of video game context you lose your sense of self-awareness and defer some of that to the character itself um, 
<clears throat> the second theory which often is used to explain this effect is this notion of uh, behavioral confirmation. So in, in a nutshell, the piece of that theory that's relevant here is the idea um, that we will characterize people based upon rules of thumb heuristics um, on the back of different types of characteristics, physical characteristics. So the way people look might tell us something about the way they're going to act um, because we've encountered people that look certain way before and maybe there's a, some, some level of consistency in how they act. So attractive people might be stereotyped as being more confident because we've come across most of the attractive people we've come across do tend to behave in that way. Not always, obviously, but that's a, why it's a stereotype. So we kind of confirm those, those, those notions of, of, of what we expect from them and play those out. And then the last part of the equation is what's referred to as self-perception theory. The self-perception theory on, on the surface seems quite counterintuitive, but what it proposes, and there's a lot of um, evidence, research evidence, um, to support this as being a fairly robust um, um, model of human behaviour. What it suggests is that in some part we judge ourselves based upon how we behave. Okay, so we don't always necessarily know what we're going to do in any given uh, context, any given situation. Sometimes we surprise ourselves with the way we behave. So think about people, you know, who act heroically, kind of run into burning buildings to save, you know, a dog or what have you. Afterwards, when they're interviewing and they'll just say, oh, you know, I didn't, you know, just a normal person, I, you know, I didn't think I was capable of this kind of thing. This happens quite a lot, that we surprise ourselves, we behave, you know, in the way that, hey, we don't always know, particularly in unfamiliar situations, what we're going to do. <clears throat> so Bems have proposed this theory that part of how we, evaluate ourselves as individuals based upon our performance. So we don't always go into situations knowing that I'm going to do A, B and C. Um, we react in the moment and, and um, you know, we don't go into, into situations performing a script. You know, we, we, you know, we, we do it on the fly. <clears throat> and the idea is, is that, you know, judging by the way we behave, that tells us something important about who we are. So if we act heroically, that will tell us something about who we are. Um, if we go to a party and tend to find that we're, you know, that we're the life of the party and people are um, warm to us and we, you know, we're very easy to start conversations, that tells us something about who we are. <clears throat> so kind of in combination, these three theories have been used to, to explain this Proteus effect. So that there's this overall kind of level of de-individuation because of the nature of the, the video game context and adopting a, a, a character, um, role playing as a character that leads to a level, level of a lo loss of self-awareness. But the characteristics that we take on are stereotyped based upon the different physical properties uh, of the character and then once we start engaging in those stereotypical behaviors on some subconscious level, that behavior then feeds back into our own self sense, self concept and tells us something about who we are, even if it's only for a very short period of time, it influences our self self concept and changes our, our notion of ourselves very briefly. So it's an interesting, I'm not sure <laughs> how you guys feel about that. It's quite uh, out there in terms of theory around human behavior, but it's, it's about the best um, sort of approach to understand this that I, can, that I can find and still seems to be the dominant uh, perspective on this phenomenon um, currently. So until someone comes up with a better idea, uh, this is probably the one that will stick around. <clears throat> okay, so kind of leading into the project that we've just undertaken, um, we wanted to extend uh, this research by looking at um, the Proteus effect in different groups. So most, for the most part, Proteus research so far has only been done with kind of neurotypical uh, individuals, so just regular kind of members of the, of the, the general population. It hasn't considered uh, other types of characteristics. Um, and this is where the conversation over the coffee at the University of Wolverhampton sort of sparked this idea because Liam and Gray, my two collaborators, both are um, researchers who work with people with autism. Their research is primarily around autism. 
And one of the things that autistic researchers have been debating um, for many, many years is the kind of notion of perspective taking and theory of mind, that there is a kind of dominant perspective um, that individuals with autism find it harder, um, not impossible, but find it more problematic or more difficult um, to put themselves in someone else's shoes, to, put, to imagine the world from another person's perspective. Now, part of the, that problem might be to do with the, the paradigms that used to investigate this, um, but you know that seems to be the, the kind of consensus, but there's a debate over that. It's quite a fierce debate. So the, you know, the level of which that perspective taking is, is difficult or, or achievable is, is up for debate. But there seems to be at least a, a, um, some level of, of agreement that um, perspective taking is something that people with autism perhaps are slightly more deficient in uh, than neurotypical uh, members of the population. So they will often display um, atypical social behaviors so they find it harder uh, to put themselves into someone else's shoes. <clears throat> so that kind of sparked the idea for the project. Well, if, 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 if there is this issue with perspective taking and there is a deficiency in terms of that, in terms of that social skill, how would that impact on something like the Proteus effect? Because part of how Proteus works is the idea that you can put yourself in someone else's shoes, i.e. The, the avatar or the character that you're playing as. So it was just a just sparked a conversation that this would be something that would be really interesting to look at. So on the one hand, the, the, there's the potential that it, you know perhaps people with autism would not be able to experience Proteus in the same way. However, there's also quite a lot of research around um, video gaming and autism. And indeed, there's quite a lot of um, literature which suggests that people with autism um, are drawn to video games. They're drawn to the immersive environments of video games. Um, and they often have a preference for um, online gaming technology and in interacting with others via this technology rather than face to face. So the kind of mediated nature um, of the communication platform, the fact it's not taking place in a co-present environment seems to be something that's a preferential um, for people with autism. And part of the reason for that might be that it's much easier to manage interactions when you don't have all of this information to process. So when you're interacting with someone face to face, you've got obviously the things they're saying, but you've also got their facial expressions and you've also got their use of body language. And all of these different things can often be competing. So sometimes people can say things and then express facial expressions that seem to go against what they're saying. And, you know, and it's very hard to kind of weigh up all that information. So the more cues that you have available, often that ends up being more complex. And particularly if you find it difficult to, to kind of read social information, you'd want to kind of pare that down so you've got less available information to cause uh, less confusion. Um, also, um, Gray and Liam themselves have done some research suggesting that um, interacting with human-like agents, so for example, uh, cartoons or video game characters, improve social and communicative deficits um, with people with autism. So there might be the potential that you could use something like the Proteus effect as a training opportunity um, to help people with autism to learn um, about different types of um, social skills in an environment that they find pleasing to be a part of and that they're naturally drawn towards. So this kind of sparked the idea for this project. You know, the initial thing that we're interested in is does Proteus work with people with autism? <clears throat> so we, we wanted to investigate this from a couple of different perspectives. One was to look at the in-game behavior. And um, most of the research which had been done looking at Proteus in the past it's very limited in terms of the in-game behavior that they look at. So they kind of just look at people, how they communicate with one another um, within that virtual world. We wanted to look at other things as well, like how the character interacts with the environments within the virtual world. Do they um, partake in activities that are more stereotypically associated with those features that they um, believe the character would have? Um, but we also decided to adopt the, the, the typical 
uh, economic game um, that, that's used in all the other Proteus projects to see if that still, still worked. <clears throat> so we're interested in whether avatar characteristics affected in-game behavior and interaction choices, and also whether um, the avatar characteristics affect um, performance in the economic game as a proxy measure of kind of confidence. And thirdly, we're interested in whether there are any differences between um, autistic individuals and a matched group of neurotypical um, members of the population. And there is potentially the argument to see how the, the findings could go one of number of ways. So obviously the issue with uh, perspective taking might suggest that the protest effect would be less powerful for people with autism, um, but also the fact that they, they're drawn to video games and some in, interesting research suggesting that their social skills can, can improve or be trained to improve in the video game context might suggest that you know, using a virtual agent um, would be helpful in terms of helping them to understand different ways of interacting and social norms and nuances. <clears throat> okay, so as I said, this is a work in progress. Um, study has been put on hold for it was put on hold for a little while, but we've just started it back up again. Um, but we managed to collect data from 32 participants to start off with. Uh, which is a good starting point. It's given us some interesting data and uh, say some significant statistical effects, which I'll, um, I'll talk about later. So to date, we've got 32 participants as part of our sample, um, 16 uh, who self-identified as autistic. Uh, we also used a, 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 a typical measure um, to, you know, to differentiate autistic versus um, neurotypical, um, a, a validated measure and the difference between the two groups is as you would expect. So the autistic group score much higher on that scale than the neurotypical group. Um, mean age roughly, roughly the same and a similar kind of distribution of male and female. So roughly about half and half um, each way. So the two groups are, are matched um, quite closely. Uh, and the, the key difference obviously being that one group are um, identified as autistic and the other group are not. Uh, we th further split the groups down uh, but randomly by the avatar that they're assigned. So some of them were assigned an attractive avatar uh, and some of them were assigned an unattractive avatar. Now these avatars were pilot tested so we designed uh, loads and loads of different avatars and by the way just, just, to, just to go back a little bit we used the game The Sims um, I think it's The Sims 4, um, which has a lot of options in terms of how you design characters, but also has lots of options in terms of how you interact with the world around you. And that was what we were really interested in, is, is how they interacted with the environment. So we wanted to get something that had a great um, level of kind of flexibility in terms of what you do with the characters once you're in, within the game. So they use the game The Sims. <clears throat> um, we designed lots and lots of avatars. Um, and then we test them and ask participants to rate them in terms of their level of attractiveness. And then we chose the one that was rated the highest and the one that was rated the lowest. Um, and there was a significant difference between those two ratings. So we have the, um, we had an attractive avatar and a less attractive avatar. We didn't manipulate height because uh, that wasn't possible within this particular game that we manipulated uh, attraction and that attractiveness. And that included things like, um, um, body shape, um, hairstyle, clothes, and so on. So I, I couldn't get uh, any pictures of the actual avatars we've created. Um, should have got them from the last time I was in the lab, but I forgot. <laughs> but this is just to kind of give you an example of the kind of ways in which you can manipulate different characters within the Sims. So you can choose things like body types, so you can have um, more muscular body types, slim body types, or, or um, more overweight body types, or um, so that, as you can imagine, the attractive avatar was kind of more muscular um, and the, the less attractive avatar um, had a bit of a beer belly. Um, irrespective of whether they were male or female participant, we decided to just use um, male characters within the game. Um, I think this is something that we might explore in future in terms of you, in, um, having characters of different 
uh, taxes, but for the purpose of this, we try to keep it uh, consistent. But yeah. So irrespective of whether you're a female participant or a male participant, you, you participated in the game as a male character. <clears throat> okay, so once the um, participant had, uh, had been randomly allocated a, an avatar, they were given some instructions on how to play the game. Um, and then they were given an opportunity to free play so they could do whatever they want within the house that we built for them. And the house had everything. It had a swim pool, had a kitchen with all the mod cons, virtual reality, it had library, um, chess set, and everything, everything you can imagine it was a proper nice bachelor pad. Um, and there were also other characters within uh, the house itself and they were NPCs or non-playable characters. Now the um, participant was told that one of those characters belonged to another participant, which was a lie. <laughs> it was a deception. It did. They were all NPCs, but we'll, I'll explain why we said that in a bit. <clears throat> so the, the, the individual could play in the game for as long as they want. We recorded that and they could do whatever they wanted. So they can sit and sit down on, on the sofa for for 15 minutes or they could go around and interact with the other characters or they could go and go for a swim or cook a meal or have a shower they could do whatever they wanted and the characters in the sims have needs um, if you've not played the game before they have um, basic needs including hunger um, including um, thirst i think as well um, sleep um, physical activity and obviously they need to also use the toilet <laughs> so you when a character has this particular need it'll often flash up as a little sort of um, speech bubble above their head so for example if they as you can see in those pictures there if they have a need for food my little pizza slice might appear above their head if they have a need to use the loo a little picture of a, of a toilet will, will flash up above their head and it's up to you whether you decide you want to help them to, to, to fulfill that need or not. Um, sometimes the consequences are quite amusing if you don't. So if you don't feed them, obviously they'll get very hungry and miserable. If you don't allow them to, to use the loo, uh, the toilet, then they might wee themselves on the spot, urinate on the spot, for example. <laughs> so you can be quite cruel to your character if you wanted to be. Above other than that, they can do whatever they want. They can just go around the house and in, in, engage in the game in whatever fat way they fancy. They weren't given any, any instructions or told to behave in a particular way, just told to play the game and work however they wanted. Um, after they, they finished their 15 minutes of free play, uh, we were, they, they were told that next door, one of the other, uh, the other person who was playing as one of the other characters was going to come through and they were going to play the economic game, which is where they were negotiate over this, this fictional pot of money. Um, that person was, in fact, a confederate. So it was um, someone who was given a, a kind of set instructions on how to respond during the economic game. So there was consistent response every time. But the participant wasn't aware that this person was a confederate. We asked all the participants at the end if they were aware of the deception, and all of them said no. They all believed that the person was a real participant. So obviously they were a very good actor. We also performed the content analysis of the, the game interaction choices. So we counted the frequencies with which um, the characters, or via their character, they engaged in different behaviors like feeding themselves, chatting to the um, being abusive to other characters, flirting with other characters. Yeah, and we, we, I'll give you some examples later. And we looked at the differences in those frequency counts between the different conditions. <clears throat> so just to kind of give you an overview of how the economic game works. Um, in the first round, so they're given a, a fictional pot of money, I think, which is 100 pounds. That's roughly about the same as $100. Um, depending upon the current exchange rate, they in the first round the participant, i.e., not the confederate, the real participant, is asked what they how they want to split that. Now they're told that they can split it however they want. They can the the the, the, the aim of the game is to try and get as much as they can. But if the if the other person doesn't agree to the split, then no one gets any money. 
So they're kind of trying to negotiate between asking for as much as they can to get themselves as much as they can, but not taking it too far. Because if they ask for 100, you know, 95% or something, it's likely that the other person's going to turn them down. So it's kind of straddling that, that, that sort of um, line between being, you know, being reasonable, but also trying to make as much money for yourself as possible. So in the first round, a participant decides how they want to split it. Normally, as you'd imagine, they, they ask for more for themselves than, the other per than they're willing to give the other person. In the second round, the Confederate offers what's referred to as a fair split. So the Confederate says, I'm willing because each round you get a new set of money. So in the second round, another hundred pounds to, to negotiate with. In the second round, the, the Confederate says, I'll offer 50-50. So we can have 50 pounds each, $50 each. And the participant decides if they accept or decline that. In the third round, participant again gets to offer the split. And then finally, in the last round, the Confederate offers what's referred to as an unfair split. So 75, 25. So they want 75% for themselves and 25% to give to the, the participants. And again, the participant decides if they want to accept or decline. Okay, <clears throat> so here's some data for you. And again, this is based on 32 participants, so we're hoping to extend this. But already we've got some really interesting and, and fairly significant effects. So as you can see here, um, we'll, I'm showing you the round one and round three data. We didn't get anything from the accept decline data. Um, that was of interest so hopefully when we've got a few more participants that something might come out of that but this is the, the rounds where the participant offers the split so they decide how much they want for themselves and they decide how much they want to give to their partner now as you can see if we look at the first round the participants who had attractive characters irrespective of what condition they were in, whether they were autistic or whether they were neurotypical, um, asked for a lot more share of the pot, so 68% and 65%, compared to the participants who were um, playing as the unattractive character. Again, irrespective of whether they were autistic or neurotypical, uh, in which case they asked for 56% and 45% respectively. That difference overall um, is significant. So the overall mean um, was 66.5 for the um, participants playing as the attractive character and 50.94 for participants playing um, as the unattractive character. So a 16% um, higher um, demand uh, for the attractive character compared to the unattractive character. So this, on the surface, would seem to suggest um, that there is uh, a protest effect going on, that the um, <clears throat> participants felt more confident asking for a higher amount of money um, when they were playing, after they played as an attractive character, compared to when they were playing as an unattractive character. Remember, this is a between subjects design. I guess the other interesting thing um, is what happens in round three. So as we see in round three, there's a, a quite a substantial drop um, for the autistic participants playing as the attractive character. They go from 68% is what they want in round one to 56% in round two. Um, and that difference is significant. Whereas the um, neurotypical participants, when they're playing as an attractive character, go from 65 in the first round to 63.75. So very little difference in the third round, and that's not significant. So there's an interaction there. So it seems that although in the first round, both sets of participants felt more confident asking for a bigger share of money when they played as an attractive character, in the third round, um, that effect only seemed to hold true for the, for the neurotypical participants. That participants of autism lowered their their wage their wager or what have you substantially 
So the amount of money they wanted got reduced by almost by over 10 percent. So that might suggest that on the surface they're, they're, they're more um, they're less resistant to peer pressure. So remembering in round two, the, the Confederate offers a fair split. And for some people that might guilt them into thinking, well, like, maybe I need to be a bit nicer when it, when it comes back to my turn. And it seems that the, the, the um, autistic participants are more likely um, to be, you know, to, to kind of to lower the, the amount. And that might suggest that they're, they're less resistant to peer pressure. Whereas the neurotypical participants hold on to their to their stake, so perhaps it suggests that the uh, protease effect is um, stronger um, for for people um, who are neurotypical and, is, and less powerful for people with autism. Although there is all evidence to suggest that it does occur for both groups. <clears throat> Very briefly, because I'm aware that the time is running out, but in terms of the content analysis where we looked at different behaviours, here's some examples of some of the things that we found. So we did a, a chi-squared analysis where we looked at the four different groups. So neurotypical with the attractive avatar, neurotypical with the unattractive avatar, autistic with the attractive avatar, and autistic with the unattractive avatar. And we counted the observations of numbers of different types of behaviors. So this first one here is flirtatious communication. So we counted the number of times in which participants engaged in flirtatious behavior. So their character flirted with other characters within the game. As you can see, uh, when you're the neurotypical attractive um, avatar condition, 21 observations of this, this behavior. But the three other groups, very low, one, three, and one. Uh, and that difference is significant. So there's some suggestion that um, people with autism, uh, when they adopt an attractive avatar, are not being influenced by protists to the same extent, at least in terms of their understanding of um, the characteristics that you'd associate with more attractive characters. They don't necessarily associate it with flirting, whereas the um, neurotypical individuals do. However, in terms of other types of activities within the house that one might associate with more attractive uh, individuals, i.e. physical activities like swimming and exercising, the groups of the attractive avatar, both of them, neurotypical and autistic participants, were more likely to engage in those behaviours than the participants who had unattractive avatars. So 21 observations and 18 versus 5 and 7. The other interesting thing that we looked at was that when people denied the characters their basic needs. So when the character said, I need to go to the toilet or I'm hungry, can you feed me? The number of times in which they clicked off that to say, no, I'm not going to do that, <laughs> they say, which is a bit sadistic, but it's quite fun. We noticed some interesting uh, examples here. The attract this happened more often with the attractive avatar. So people seem to be more um, inclined to want to punish the attractive avatar, but particularly uh, the autistic participants wanted to do it much more. Not quite sure why. Um, we need that probably needs a little bit of thought and discussion, but I thought it was interesting nonetheless. Um, and hopefully this, this um, finding will hold out once we've doubled or tripled the sample, which is the plan. OK, so just to make sure we've got a little bit of time for discussion or questions, just to just to kind of um, summarize the key bits of this, of this project. I, I think the findings suggest both through looking at the in-game behavior and also um, looking at the, the round one in particular um, of the, the um, economic gain is that the protease effects seem to work for both neurotypical and autistic participants. So they both asked for more money when they played as attractive avatars and they both engaged in more, um, at least in some respects, more activities that one might associate with the, with the character who's more attractive, i.e. spent more time uh, trying to get fit. There is perhaps, though, some evidence to suggest that the effect is slightly stronger um, for neurotypical. So, for example, they were more likely to engage in flirtatious behaviour in the game, so adopt a wider array of behaviours that one would stereotypically associate with the physical properties of the character. Uh, but also they were more resistant um, and, and to the peer pressure from the Confederate and they stuck to their guns in terms of asking for a similar level of, uh, of money or a larger proportion of the share of the pot in the third round of the economic game. Um, 
the fact that the Proteus effect, at least on some level, works for autistic individuals, I think has some exciting potential for clinical applications. Um, for example, social communicative interventions, training, um, development of social skills. Um, and that's an area that once we've completed the project, we'll try to move this into next. Thanks for listening. Um, any questions? Excellent. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, Dr. Fullwood. Uh, yes, we do have some questions funneling in. Um, since I'm moderating, I'll ask the first one. <laughs> um, I was wondering, first off, I know personally the, the Proteus effect doesn't work for me when I'm playing uh, as Rory McElroy on the golf video golf. It doesn't it doesn't spill over to the, my offline game. But I might Is that because be you play really badly in the game? <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I mean, you can I'm, look like Rory McIlroy, but if you play, if you play like um, you know no. your normal self, <laughs> right? Exactly. Um, I'm wondering, are you aware as you started digging into the, this idea, if this type of effect has been looked at um, with social media usage, um, specifically, you know, if if people are, are reading a lot of negative feeds, if that spills over. Um, to their own online, just just keeping it online, if they're online. It does, yeah. I mean, the, the similar kind of um, uh, effects, I guess. But yeah, social media has been normally been investigated in, in the light of social comparisons, um, self-presentation, and how that impacts upon people's self-concepts. So there's a really neat study where they, all they did was they asked the participants to spend some time um, Kind of polishing their profile i guess or you know sort of adding photographs and um you know changing their about me and just spend some time sort of making their their profile look neater and they compared that to participants who just basically scrolled through the news feed and the participants who spent more time kind of updating and polishing their profile then had a, a leap in terms of their self-esteem uh, from pre and post intervention um, which I think is really interesting. So just the simple act of spending time sort of curating your online self, because most of the time when people are, are creating profiles, as we know in social media, is they tend to um, reflect the more positive elements of, of their life than right. they do the more negative elements of their life, because you know we want to present an idealized image and we want people to warm to us. And also because you know social media encourages that because everyone else does it, right. um, and we have the ability to be you know, much more selective over the kinds of information that we share. So yeah, there's there's evidence that just engaging in the simple act of kind of you know, say curating your online self affects your self esteem, but also there's evidence to show that when people are exposed to um, downward so sorry upward social comparisons, so where they're looking at people who um, seem to be performing better in whatever domain is relevant to them. So whether that's they're more attractive or they're, they're earning more money, uh, that again, that has a negative impact on people's um, sense of self-worth. Excellent, thank you for that answer. Um, so I'm gonna take uh, with the time remaining, just the questions that have been um, posted um, and we'll see how many we can get to. Um, so uh, the next question is, uh, they're, they're asking, is the effect stronger between different types of games so maybe as the game is closer to reality, such as The Sims versus a fantasy type game like World of Warcraft, uh, to use uh, a dated game example. So yeah, basically I mean, that's a, that's a fascinating question. I mean, the, the, the honest answer is I don't know. I can, I can, as far as I'm aware, there haven't been any research studies which have looked at that. Um, I can speculate, but it would be just pure speculation. Sure. I imagine with something like the Proteus effect that it would work better in an environment in which you know that there is some level of realism i think if it's too far in the realms of fantasy it's harder to kind of uh, to put yourself in in those shoes so if you you know if you have if your character has the ability to fly for example that's something that none of us can do in real life unfortunately um and i think that would be harder to, to kind of then reflect on that behavior and incorporate that into your sense of your own sense of self but i think subtle exaggerations of a character in terms of being you know, more, more, more well-toned or, or better, more intelligent or what have you, I think are things that could then reflect back on how, how we feel about ourselves. What's really, what we'd really like to do is the next study, we probably would have already done this if it wasn't for COVID, um, is we're really interested in what happens when people play as animals or, or, or non-human avatars. 
So might there, for example, be uh, things that we associate with different types of animals? So dogs, you might think of loyalty. Uh, fox, you might think cunning. A lion, you might think brave. Uh, if you if you play as different animals, might that affect um, you know your sense of self around those different characteristics that you associate with them? Um, I guess the answer to that question is watch this space. Um, maybe the next time I, I'm invited to come over and do a talk at LME, I'll have some data to present on. <laughs> that would be awesome. Um, next question uh, is, is asking if you're attempting to control for video game skills and interest, uh, would the gameplay learning curve serve as a barrier to the effect uh, because the subject can't fully invest in the narrative of the game until they really know how to play it? Yeah, no, I mean, again, something that's quite difficult to do in the kind of context of, of a research program like this, um, partly because in terms of, you know, the autistic participants that we have to, um, you know, the, obviously there are fewer um, of them in the general population, they're much more difficult to recruit. Um, so, you know, we don't necessarily have the opportunity to kind of count, to, to counterbalance those kind of things. But I think you're absolutely right. I think if you, you know, if you're not a game or you don't enjoy games, it's going to be harder to get into it, as you say, it's, it's to, to get into the narrative because you just not, you have no interest in it. Um, and there'll be certain types of games that, that some of us enjoy more than others. And, and you know. so, yeah, I, I think it's something that we would, we would have liked to have done and to have matched them, but it would have been just, I think would have made the, the data collection <laughs> quite difficult. Um, mm -hmm. What we hoped, I guess, was that the two groups would just naturally, you know, if they're large enough, would naturally kind of meet in, in terms of their experiences there. Um, but it's perhaps, again, it's, a, it's another piece of research that needs to be done. I think you know, in terms of the protest effect, it, there's not been a huge amount of research that's been done over the last decade, um, but I, there's loads of unanswered questions. Um, so maybe, you know, you guys, if you've got access to this kind of kit, you could do some of these projects and then come and invite me to to write up the write up the no I'm only kidding <laughs> yeah for sure that's I think that's one of the collaborations on this but yeah I think you're yeah. absolutely right I suspect that things like experience of gameplay um, you know the types of games that you enjoy um, all of those different characteristics will have an effect on on not necessarily whether the process effect occurs but maybe how str the strength of the effects I think you're absolutely right and I, I think there's some projects there that need to be done. Yeah, it's a really uh, it's, it's a really nice research design because it, it does bring to surface a lot of different kind of questions and ideas and, and, and follow up some ways to go. Um, I know we're, we're just about out of time, but we have a couple more questions here. Um, so the next attendee um, says that um, they are not familiar with avatars except from the movie. Uh, the movie, right. movie avatar. Uh, what do you think the meaning would be? Uh, I think they're asking, do you think the meaning would be different if someone chose an avatar with a larger body type? So I think with an avatar, we're looking, because I mean, this research tends to be done in two different ways, either, say, with kind of more video game characters um, in which you're kind of looking down upon, the, you know, the, the character that you've designed, or sometimes they, they do it in a more avatar way, in which you kind of embody the character, I guess. You kind of live inside of them. Um, so that might be a more sort of virtual reality. So, you know, you can obviously adjust things like, you know, your perception of, of your, your height by making it look like everyone else is, is, is below your eye level. Um, so, yeah, you can, and I, and I think actually in some respects that that can be much more powerful, um, you know, looking down upon a character you know, from above, I think would be very different in terms of level of immersion and kind of, in, you, know, in, you know, being inside of the body of that character. Um, and I know there's a lot of really interesting work where they've done things like look at virtual body swapping, um, where they've, they've allowed you to kind of live inside someone else's body. Um, so, you know, they've done things like with male, female. So, you know, by a really clever kind of use of the technology, when you look through your virtual reality kit, you look down and you see the other participant's body and they see your body. And you can go and give yourself a handshake, which is really, really weird. What's really interesting about that research is, is first of all, how easily and how quickly people accept the new body. You'd think it would be something that would just, just make you go, this is weird and I'm not, and you would just reject it. 
but actually people accept it really quickly. Um, and I think that's probably because your brain just wants to make sense of the world. Um, and there's things going on, obviously, it's, you know, it's, un it's unconscious level, subconscious level that you're not aware of. Um, but your brain just wants to make sense of the world, obviously doesn't want it to be confusing. It's the same with things like optical illusions, you know, um, there's a really great one where if you put like a, I would say, a, a colored dot on a white piece of paper, and you know, and you and you move it so that it's outside of your field of vision, but you can still see the still see the the paper in your peripheral. Um, the the dot disappears, but it's not replaced with nothingness. It's replaced with the color of the paper behind it. That's just your brain filling in the information, um, and it does that automatically, and you can't stop it. And I think it's the same with things like this. Um, it just wants to make sense of it, but it has it. The fact that it wants to make sense of it so quickly, and the fact that it wants to to accept that new body so quickly has, I think, potential um, ramifications of things like healing divides and, and getting people to get along with each other. So there's been some really great research recently in which they they, they got people to, to um, live inside a body just very briefly of someone from a different ethnic background. And they found that just doing that for a few minutes um, massively reduced their levels of um, their levels of um, bias and, st and stereotypes and 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 in it and and, and um, you know that that has real potential implication in terms of healing different divides because we do live in a very uh, polarized society at the moment and I think the internet as we might um, imagine plays quite a big role in that I'm not sure if that actually answered the question <laughs> I went off on a bit of a tangent I think so. it made some sense to me. Um... So uh, I want to be respectful of your time. Uh, there's still a, a couple more questions. Some of them I think you've already kind of answered in your other responses. So um, with your permission, uh, are you okay if uh, a couple of attendees email you? Um, yeah, no, absolutely. Okay. I'm always open to, to conversation and discussion and any okay. research talk is always fun. So yeah, my email address is uh, c.fullwood, F-U-L-L-W-O-O-D, at wlv.ac.uk um, and we have um, yes we have you listed with your bio and your email information is there too um wherever you logged in for um attendees participants uh if you're watching this via re video recording uh you can get chris's dr fullwood's email there uh where his bio is uh as well so um thank you so much a very interesting talk um I've got some uh, ideas to throw your way the next time I'm able to meet with crew, uh, hopefully after the semester is over. Uh, it was great seeing you. I know that it's uh, it's five o'clock your time and Friday and uh, you're probably uh, ready to head to the pub. So it's gin o'clock. Yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> thanks yeah. for thanks for inviting me, Trey. And yeah, I'm looking forward to catching up at some point. But uh, yes. I hope the rest of the conference goes really well. Uh, looks like you've got some really interesting talks. So yes. take care, everyone. And Thanks for inviting me. Thanks so much, Chris. Take care. Thank you so much.